from the University of Bath. If we could just give them a round of applause and then we'll take it off. You can't get away that easy. I would talk even if you didn't give me a round of applause. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, and I'm not just here as me, really. I'm here as all these people as well. Um, uh, so joint work with um, PhD students, so Garraway and Alessandro, um, Sarah and uh, lawyers at UCL, Sarah and Ivor Anthropic. I was over there somewhere. Um, and Carl Henrik and Erica at the University of Bristol. Um, so I was going to talk about two things today, based on the audience and what we've been seeing so far. I think I'll focus more on the first and then and sort of speed through and show some maybe results from the second part. Cool. Um, so the first part is, I think, what are we using our generative model for? And so you might do different things depending on what you want to use the generative model for. For me, um, uh, the kind of motivation comes a little bit from intelligent systems. So if we, I don't, I'm not a fan of discriminative models in general. I think in order to solve some of the, the sort of more AI challenges, we really need to think about, um, in order to say, I need to build a model of the world, I need to translate between different types of data, what happens if I have missing data, all of these things, if I can generate new data, then I can demonstrate that I'm understanding these things. So that to me is, is a high level motivation. Um, and I think there's also a thing of like most of these tasks involve modeling the data distribution, but that's not the only thing that general models can be used for and usefully for. So that's my sort of caveat at the start. So for example, if you're doing in painting and films and you want to generate some beautiful picture, like you don't necessarily need to model the data distribution. So there's always two halves to everything. On the other hand, I'm particularly excited with the talks we've had so far because I think this is very important for, say, medical applications. So lots of the things I'm talking about are going to be, I think, key for, for these kind of applications where you want data efficiency um, and you care very much about uncertainty and confidence and things like that. And these are critical things to me. So to me, the, the thing that keeps me up at night, the biggest crime is to be overconfident in your output. So I don't worry too much about accuracy per se. You can get something wrong if you want to as long as you know that you've got it wrong. The, the crime is to say, oh, it's definitely this, and to be wrong, because that's dangerous. Um, and then sort of my cartoon illustration of this would be, we're all happy with a sort of general, this is just TensorFlow Playground, but this is just our whatever neural network. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, we've got, say, two classes here in a discriminative setting. Um, this is fine if you're just doing cats and dogs or something like that, but what if we take it a bit more seriously? What if it's cars? What if it's driving? So I've got blue dots are drive, orange dots are don't drive. And then my question is, what happens when we're here? And so, like in this case, maybe you can drive, but should you? I don't know. You, you, you've trained in, all of your training data comes from sort of towns here, and you've got uh, the jungle here. Here, you definitely shouldn't drive. You're about to go into a load of trees. And it's this kind of thing, like your decision boundary is here. I think we're happy with the, what I'm showing with the heat map. The heat map is what I think. So I'm very, very confident that it's class blue and it doesn't matter how far away from training data you are, like epistemic uncertainty be damned, I'm, I'm quite happy that you should drive there. And, and to me, if you have a generative model and you combine it, say it's non-parametric, you can do the Bayesian part of it, you can be uncertain, you'll get outputs, uh, sorry, I've swapped orange for red, but you get outputs such as this. So this is what I mean when I say a distribution. So it's not just some numbers that happen to add to one. It's a, it's a systematic thing of saying I need to allocate mass. And so I only, have so much, I only have so much earth to allocate. So if I put it where the data is, implicitly I'm taking it away from other places. So if I were to come over here, the label is 50-50, which is I don't know. So even though maybe on this side, you're probably slightly more likely to be read, but really the take home message is you shouldn't really do. You shouldn't drive. You should be, if I'm not very confident, I can decide, I won't diagnose this, I'll, I'll go talk to a clinician, I'll, uh, I'll stop the car because I'm not confident about what I'm doing. Cool, cool. Um, and then, so what's the difficulty? So, so we, if we want to use generative models, why don't we just use them all the time, based generative models in imaging? Well, we've got these huge degrees of freedom in images and we don't know what the likelihood function should be. Like if I do Gaussian regression, or so, like a, a, a regression with a Gaussian error function, I know exactly what the likelihood should be, which is a kind of saying a loss function, but it's even more than just a loss function. It's a, saying a loss function has to be a likelihood. It has to be a distribution, not just a, an error metric. And we don't know what that should be over images. At least I don't believe we do. Um, 
But there's hope, and then we get excited by the deep models because we say, well, we can parameterize things from lots of data now. We can do lots of computation, we have access to lots of training data, so could we learn some of the likelihood functions? And then we'd be out of our difficulties and back into, into happy land. Um, but there's a problem with hugely parameterizing things from lots of data, and this is my thing of, with great power you comes your great responsibility, and one of my favorite XKCDs about error propagation, like you don't know, if, we, if we're not careful about how we treat all these parameters, we don't necessarily get a distribution back, and we don't learn a likelihood. So it's not for free that you le automatically learn a likelihood. You have to be careful about how you construct it and how you use the network in order to make sure that the likelihood is, is what you actually wanted at the end. Um, so, how do, how do deep generative middles fit into this, in this worldview I'm painting? Well, we kind of got these two divides, and I won't go into the background of them because we, we've all talked about them, but there's kind of two sides of a, a coin. You've got the variational autoencoders, often drawn like this, which are explicitly modeling the distribution in some sense. So for every, every image in my training set, I'm trying to find a location in the latent space that gives rise to it. So I would say this spans the data. So I'm trying to represent everything that you give to me. So I'm trying to model everything. Um, but, you, but at the moment, we don't like the samples from the VA. They're blurry. I don't like these. Blah, blah, blah. And so you say, I want high quality samples. So you build something like a GAN that you specifically train to try and give you high quality samples. But the problem is you don't model the distribution. And you get things like mode collapse, the, the big failure. And then uh, so the, uh, the GAN is something like this. And then there's a whole load of all kinds of exciting things that people try and uh, combining the two. And you trade off the different parts. There's a really nice review from Michaela and DeepMind and, and her colleagues basically saying it doesn't really work out. You, you kind of trade one or the other. You can kind of have one or the other. In any given situation, I can get one or the other, but I can't get both with these kind of constructs. I think this is, the, but inherently, picking a high quality sample is, is sacrificing the likelihood. So if you train like this and you want the samples, that's fine, but you won't be getting this. You can't have them both at the moment. Um, well, yes, we, we've seen those, so I'll skip over those. But basically, this ends up with this other massive cycle. This is chasing the state of the art from Research in Progress. It's my favorite blog when we were doing my PhD. And this is what we're going around in circles. So you can VA and you can uh, GAN all the time, but you basically end up stuck in one or the other, depending on which, how much of one you do. Um, and I think part of this, in some respects, also comes from we have unreasonable expectations. So I take, is a random image from the Celebate data set or something like that, and you say, okay, go away and learn me a low dimensional latent space to generate this image. Uh, can this image be generated from a low dimensional latent space? I mean, it's a difficult, you, we haven't really specified the task, because I did my identity or something like that. If we want to classify whether it's me or someone else, then maybe you don't need many vectors to do that to get the same person but to get the same image back to get my hair in the right place if you want this sample to be of high quality a one megapixel image or something like that to get the pores in my skin and the freckles everything in the right place that requires a huge number of numbers like this is not a 12 dimensional latent space to get the image back so the GAN is trying to generate you a perfect image which contains much more information say than the the dimensionality of the latent space that you put in so you're not getting that image back, you're getting an image back, because I'm going to have to make up from, from randomness the, next, the rest of the information that I need. And this is this thing of like, well, you can't... So we, we should acknowledge that if we're asking for a low-dimensional construct in something, we're going to be sacrificing, or we don't, we, we're going to be specifying only a subset of the things that we want. And the problem, again, as well, is that at the moment we sort of throw things in, and what comes out, we then say retroactively, that's a subset. In faces... The sort of smooth, low-frequency stuff that we get out kind of mostly encodes your identity, so we're happy about identity. But that's more luck than plan, I would argue, in this case. Um, so if I was trying to be explicit about them, I would say things like uncertainty from the model. So actually propagating the uncertainty all the way through the model. This is something that's going to be very important. And, and what the latent space should look like. So we, we use quite simple priors in the latent space, but the posterior distribution in the latent space is really important, and this is what's going to encode for me, anyway, when I'm doing purely generative models, how useful that space is. If, if the latent space isn't nice and smooth, and if the latent space doesn't contain all the data, then I, it's not going to be useful as a generative model for me. 
Um, we also want this uncertainty of, of moving away. So this is the idea of moving away from data, the epistemic uncertainty. As I move away from data, I haven't, like if I didn't give you the right training data, I haven't narrowed down certain parts of the model, so I should keep that uncertainty. Like in a medical imaging situation, I think this is kind of Arvid's question. Like if, if, we, if we're always trained on healthy data and I show you something that's got a tumor in the middle of it, we should be quite uncertain about our reconstruction there. And maybe that uncertainty is sufficient to, to say, actually flag this up. Someone needs to go and look at this. Um, and then actually in the output of the model. So because of that, uh, that this, is, this comes back to the point I was making with the face. If we, if we haven't really specified the task fully, then we're not going to be able to give you the perfect output. So the things we fail to give you, we should in some way account for. Um, and something I'm not going to talk about, but I think are really important, and that's a lot of the things. And I, I, I would put these kind of constructs in, so you're, you're getting a double bath whammy the, uh, next talk. She will be talking about some amazing constructs in, say, Hologan, and that's that kind of thing of like putting structure inside the networks is putting priors in what you're getting back. And I think that's another very important avenue of research. So I'm not going to talk about that. These are the two parts. Um, I'm going to talk about it in the opposite order, in fact, orange, orange and blue. Um, and one final thing is I think whenever we do something before we, before we talk about it, we should think about how to evaluate. So in some ways, training of generative models is an unsupervised learning task. And the sort of way we always evaluate, I mean, there was a nice discussion at one of the DALI workshops about this. Is, is, uncertain, is unsupervised learning really a thing? So I said before, what are you going to use your generative model for? You can't really evaluate unsupervised learning in the abstract. It's a quite difficult thing to do. You kind of have to say, well, we're using a generative model as a proxy for a hierarchical prior for medical imaging reconstruction or something like that. Um, but, it, but often that means that we have to fixate on the reconstruction likelihood, but we're good people, so we don't just do it from the training data, we do it from the test data, so that's all good. But then there's a problem, so say I take some celebe training images and I put them through a variation also encoder and I get the image back, and my reconstruction likelihood, well, this likelihood, this is the thing I was talking about before, that say an L2 loss is unnormalized, there's no posterior in the in latent space, and so the identity function would give you the exact image back, but you would have learned nothing. And not only that, for the test data, it would as well. If I gave you the test data and you just gave me the test data back, you go, hey, this is exactly what I gave you. You've, you, you get all of the marks. But inherently, learning, <laughs> learning something is, is also learning to not do things. So if I put a picture of a giraffe into the identity function, I would get a picture of giraffe back. And if I trained on faces, I shouldn't be allowed to do that. And if we have a likelihood, because the likelihood has to sum to 1, in order to put probability mass where the faces are, it has to take it away from things like giraffes. And so inherently, if you have it normalized, you know that you're going to be rejecting something, whereas otherwise we'd have to test against all possible things we should reject. And then this is this kind of thing of like, how should we balance against the model capacity the ability to reconstruct? Because if I perfectly reconstruct, then we'd probably call this something like overfitting. Um, but this is very going to be something that's very, very difficult to put a number on now, because the reconstruction one, another reason we like it, is that we can put numbers on the reconstruction likelihood. And so uh, here's an argument that what we're saying is, here's my hand wavy space of all possible images that you could generate. Orange path is the set of faces or something like that. These are face images that we like. Um, and then we could say, well, hang on a minute. If I just put something that isn't here, then maybe you should project onto it. So you should give me back the closest face to the thing it isn't. But I don't normally know, if I just give you a picture of a giraffe, you don't know what the closest human face is to that giraffe. So we still can't give you a number back. But if I take a point that is on there, so I take, say, an image from my test data set that I know that that exists on the point, if I in some way corrupt it, so I add some noise or distort it or something like that, so I sort of push it off the manifold, and then I put it through the model, then we hope that if I didn't push it off too far, the place that it should go back to is the place that I started. And then you could measure this, which is incidentally what a denoising autoencoder is trained to do. But if you didn't train the model to do this, you just say, this is how I'm going to evaluate, even though I'm not training it, then you're starting, it's not ideal, but you're starting to get an idea of, actually, have I learned, have I put mass only on the orange line and taken away mass from, from other things? So that's going to be... And people are seeing, no one's shouting and screaming. That's the, you're just too polite or you agree. Very good.
Um, so hopefully this will measure how well we capture the data distribution. Very good. So this is the um, uh, first piece of work. Um, so structure uncertainty prediction networks. And our sort of goal here, we're saying we like variation autoencoders because they capture distribution, but you don't get your nice samples out. Um, are we surprised that we don't get our nice samples out? And we get sort of smooth things like this. Well, not really, because what we, the loss function we use to evaluate during training is an L2, often, or maybe even a diagonal loss function, so a per pixel variance is estimated. And from our old school computer vision knowledge, we know that an L2 reconstruction is going to smooth. Like if I have, if I have my hair, and my hair is high frequency, so I have black, white pixels, black, white, black, white, black, white, if I get it wrong by one, white, black, white, black, black, that's a maximum cost I can incur under my L2 metric. So either I have to get my hair exactly right, I can't do that because you only gave me 12 numbers to reconstruct the whole image, can't, get, can't specify where the hair goes, so I just make it all gray, and that's the best outcome. So I'll smooth, smooth all the high frequencies, that gives me the better outcome under this, under this loss. Um, and another way of thinking about that is saying, well, we could actually make the loss function a likelihood, like the log of a a Gaussian becomes the diagonal version of it, so it's actually a diagonal Gaussian distribution that's a likelihood function at the end. So all the maths in here, there's nothing more exciting than Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distributions. Um, so we say, well, actually what we've learned is this is the mean of our reconstruction. This is the, these are the parameters of the diagonal loss, uh, the, the variance of each pixel. And so this is actually now a Gaussian model. So if I take that, I should be able to sample from it. And if I've done my job correctly, samples from this should look like the original data. So if I draw a sample from that, it looks like this. And we're not surprised that it does not look like the original data. I've made it much worse. Um, and one of the reasons is one of the only things we do know about images is that they're locally correlated. So uh, think of wavelets and things like that. We know that there are spatial correlations locally within the images. And if we have a diagonal independent function there, then we are destroying those correlations. So we're not surprised that we get back. So I'm not surprised at all. It doesn't match the data. So what if we use a structured noise model? Um, and almost it's, it's, it's almost the simplest thing you could possibly do. In some respects, we're taking, say, that covariance matrix, instead of taking them independently, let's just make a, well, in fact, it's the inverse of it. It's the precision matrix. Let's just locally connect them. So pixels are locally connected. If, uh, again, you've been doing vision for a while, this is something like a continuous, uh, uh, um, a CRF or Markov random field type model, so local connections, um, and then we draw samples. So under our local connections, this is the covariance that we get. And now we can start to see that maybe this, again I'm plotting the, the single connections, but we've, we've, we've learned something else about the data. So we see gray levels here, we're saying there are no high frequencies, so in the middle of your forehead there shouldn't really be high frequencies, but around the edges, there are high frequencies, and not just there are high frequencies, they are oriented in a vertical, in a vertical fashion. You've got some interesting things going on here around the mouse, so some teeth. So here, just white blob, but here we're saying there's some high frequencies. And then what we're kind of saying is, I don't really care exactly which high frequency you put there. I don't care if it's black, white, black, white, white, black, white, white. It's just that it has to be vertical and it has to be there. And you can't do that in the middle of your face. And so when I sample from this, I get something like this. And this is not this image exactly, but statistically speaking, these samples now look very similar to these samples. And so, in the same way, like this is an overly smooth thing that we don't like, but samples from this actually might look like samples from this. And the degrees of freedom in sampling from here are the degrees of freedom that we weren't able to capture with a latent space. So we couldn't, you, you asked us for sort of 100 numbers or something like that, we couldn't capture all of this detail in the model, but we know what we didn't capture, and what we've done is said, okay, now you can sample, so we can, we can have all the variance that's left over at the end. And um, so random draw from this would capture the statistics of the input data. And the thing that, um, so I, took me a while to come round to the networks kind of thing, and I sort of said, oh, we, we were discussing this, and I didn't believe it would be trivial to do this, and then it turns out people can, uh, you can actually sample this whole structure from the same Z space. So there's no cheating going on, there's no skip connections or anything here. You take the image, you encode it to some latent space, that's what would normally give you the mean. From that exactly the same sample in the latent space that gives you that, you can also draw a sample that parameterizes this structure covariance matrix, and then the two of them together give you the, the distribution on the, on the output. 
Um, how can you do this? Because that would be crazy lambda numbers because of all the sparsity. So we're only doing the connections very locally. So when you estimate the precision matrix or in fact the Cholesky decomposition, so this is a sparse structure here of the matrix. So you're not actually estimating huge you know, n squared parameters are not being estimated for an n pixel image only it's a linear combination so only four n so you only got four times the number of parameters you had to estimate to estimate the mean so you're not having to go crazy um, this is a wonderful thing that Garraway produced to, to really show so if we just look at say one pixel here of how the local correlations in the precision matrix actually infer global structure so this is just one uh, little patch three by three patch in there this is the uh, these are the, so most of this is zero, so those are the weights that are sparse, so only the non-zero ones are here. Um, in the precision, that's the local connectivity, so that's a three by three structure. But when I invert that and give it the, the full covariance matrix, I would get some structure like this. And so you can see that that patch there has learned local correlations and encode the whole of the, so this whole piece of hair or something coming down here has been encoded by propagating that through the whole, through the whole model. That's quite a fun visualization. Um, and this is what happens. So you say, well, now you can measure um, the standard thing. So this is our standard reconstruction thing, the thing I told you not to do, um, uh, measured under it. But if we draw some samples, we can see that samples from the VAE with the diagonal noise model, they're still not looking like the original images. These are the images where samples are going. And you're replacing all kinds of things. So if you've got glasses and things like that, your smooth result doesn't contain the glasses. But We've learned to put high frequencies in there, so you get a sample of something that looked glasses like or something like that. Um, there's also this here's here's sort of variation. So here's different samples for the same so the same the same mean function, different samples from the covariance. So you can see these are the degrees of freedom that the model has failed to capture. And so each sample will put the teeth slightly differently, the hair slightly differently, but statistically I think they all look very similar to the to the input image, including if you get bad images because people don't prepare their data properly, you get all kinds of JPEG artifacts and things and things like that. So remove your JPEG artifacts first. Uh, this is what happens. Oh wait, no, uh, sorry, that was to be. I made it easier. This is the test about the noisy evaluation. So we haven't trained on noisy Im input images, but if we put a noisy input image in and we get our smooth reconstruction, but we also get this structured covariance, I can then subtract the mean off my data. So this is the residual from the smooth version to this. And you see I've got lots of high frequencies, but some of the high frequencies are good. They encode the things we didn't know. And but most of the high frequencies are the, are the corrupted noise. So if I then project under my structured residual, these are the remaining high frequencies. So this is what the model says. These are valid high frequencies to have. These are the speckle around here is invalid. And then I put it back in, and you get the denoise uh, results back up there, um, which incidentally does a much better job than, than a denoising autoencoder. So if you train a network to do exactly this task, given noisy images produce non-ones, it doesn't do as good a job because it's using an L2 reconstruction loss at the other end, and so it can't. It, it's always going to overly smooth. Um, and there's some examples. So these are the denoising autoencoder ones. These are the samples um, under this model. And again, it wasn't trained for this task. This is just my hypothetical, this is a slightly better way to evaluate things, maybe. Cool, cool, cool. Um, so what are the limitations of this? I said it's going to be wonderful. Well, we, we, we didn't have a prop, we still don't have the proper predictive posterior in the latent space. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. So you don't really know where to draw samples from. Um, this is a problem as the VAE in general. What people say, oh, well, I'm just going to put a a unit Gaussian prior in my latent space and assume that everywhere in that space is now valid to sample from, but that may well not be true. In fact, as you get high dimensional, if we know about Gaussians, they don't, it's not a nice blob in the middle, it's actually a big shell, and so it's actually quite tricky as to work out where you should go and sample from in that space. The interesting thing is that the samples are consistent here, so the, the, the structured residual does match here, so we would say these samples aren't as good as the reconstructions, but we're not sort of putting high frequencies in completely the wrong place, they're at least paired. Um, but our standard neural network caveats apply, so we haven't really de dealt with this, what happens when we go away from data. So again, this, this likelihood function is only valid for faces. It's not a, now an image likelihood that you could apply to anything. And so we don't really have the true uncertainty from the latent space. Thing. Very good. 
Um, and now the next part, uh, super speedy through. Um, this is just uh, something I love doing. So these are Gaussian process latent variable model. So this is a sort of um, a, a dimensionality reduction technique that existed before, variation autoencoders and things like that. Um, but it has, so it's, it's tricky in that it's le learning from lots of data is hard, but when you have not very much data, it's very good at incorporating priors. It's probabilistic, it can be nonlinear, it has a nice smooth mapping, so the latent space you get out is something that you really like. And what we're basically doing is saying we're going to have a whole lot of high dimensional things, we're going to learn them from, like, I give you the high dimensional things, you learn the low dimensional vector, same as the latent space, plus this nonlinear mapping that you think goes back to this. That's what we're learning. Um, so here's a sort of example. Um, and if we know the data has a Gaussian likelihood, so not images, we know the likelihood, then we can do this. So one of the things I do, other things, is, is things on shapes. So here is a manifold where these dots, you can just about see them, these gray dots, we're training examples of curves. The curves happen to be fonts, so times New Roman and Arial. And then this has put them on the space here. Um, and the, this is sort of illustrating two things that I wanted to, to point out. First, this is smooth. As I move around here, I'm smoothly changing my data, which is good because it means if I want to use this space for optimization or something like that, moving around here is nice and smooth. The VA is not guaranteed to be smooth in the same way. And the heat map underneath is also saying where you should go to find the data. And that's the other thing I'm saying is important. So it's not a, the prior on this was also a Gaussian blob, but it's saying actually don't go down here. So you can't just sample anywhere. And if I want to go between two points, which is a, ge a geodesic, it says if you want to go between here and here, you shouldn't just go through here, you should go round. Um, if you don't like fonts, you can like other things, so you might like elephants. Um, if you don't like elephants, strange, uh, you'll like cats, so you can do this for lots of other things, but the, the key thing with here, these are all curves specified in some shape space, so they're all Gaussian. And so I would say that the shortcomings of this type of model, that say the deep generative models uh, like a VAE is addressing is that like in my, in my nice curves all these points are Gaussian and so that's fine but images say this data set uh, really really simple pixel based data set this is not a Gaussian distribution we've already said like the multivariate Gaussian before had local structure but I'm talking about global structure like if I put these into a, uh, into a GPLVM then this is what I get out some kind of weird things here. So I have all this wonderful space here, which is nice probabilistic. It tells you how to go around and sample, but it gives you nonsense on the other side, and everyone gets very sad. Um, so what are we trying to do there? Well, we're going to combine it with something else that needs to propagate. I've got uncertainty at the top there. I need to get my uncertainty down to the pixels. So we're looking at something called the restricted Boltzmann machine. So before uh, Jeff Hinton was super famous, he was still doing uh, deep things, and these are stochastic networks, so earlier, early Jeff Hinton work and his colleagues. Um, and so, unlike feedforward networks, each of the nodes here contains a distribution, a really simple distribution, a coin flip, a, a binary distribution. Um, and so the way you would sample from this is I just have some conditional sampling equations, so I say visible, say V is the visible layer, this is where the images are, I take the image, conditioned on the image, I can draw a sample of my hidden layer, and then I can fix my hidden layer, and then go back again and draw a sample of the visible layer, um, and vice versa. So I keep alternating that, and if I take one of these one-layered restricted Boltzmann machines and just stack up multiple hidden layers, like a deep network, I get a deep Boltzmann network. So the only, these are basically very similar to feed-forward networks, it's just that they contain uncertainty inside them. Um, and there was also some uh, very nice work by people up in Edinburgh um, on the shape Boltzmann machine. So what they're doing, this is the equivalent of, say, a convolutional neural network. So we're weight, weight sharing. So these squares here are just sharing weights and, and things like that. Um, and so our goal here is to say, well, can we take there's something like the GPLVM, which is, gives us really nice properties up here, but only does Gaussian things at its output, and then convert Gaussian things into non-Gaussian things that are images by pushing them through here. But because it's got uncertainty in here, the uncertainty that I model here will get pushed all the way down to the bottom of the, of the network. So the GPLVM has all these nice things, but can't deal with a non-Gaussian likelihood. The DBN provides all the propagation, but if you just learnt it by itself, it would give you no structure in this space. 
So what we're trying to do is sort of put a prior on top of the DBN that says, I want the structure to be such that the DPLVM can represent it. Very good. Um, we might just skip over this. Uh, there's one subtlety in here, is that we can train it using a concrete distribution, which is basically like the reparameterization trick for discrete things. So unlike before, where you had to do all that sampling, now you can backprop through this. So you can train it in a, as, you, as you would if it was a feed-forward network. We're just keeping track of the uncertainties as we go. So much more efficient to train than, than the old thing. So that, this contrasted divergent algorithm, that was a sampling algorithm, that was what was holding back lots of these things as well. So you just put it into TensorFlow, press the button. Um, it's kind of interesting to see the structure. So if you looked at uncertainty in networks, most people know with dropout, it's an uncertainty method. So we sample through the network. This is our linear, nonlinear activation function. And then you sample based on your probability of dropout. You can do concrete dropout where you would learn the probability there. So that's, that's better. This is a really interesting model where effectively what you're doing is you're saying, there's a constant value here, so this is my coin flip, and what I'm actually doing is parameterizing up the probability. So I'm parameterizing the probability, not parameterizing the function I feed forward. So that's the kind of contrast with the two different types of networks. And so this is what you get. Out you get sort of sharper samples than you would. So we've got the non-Gaussian likelihood function is giving us better samples at the output, but you also get this nice structured space, so it tells you how to go around in this space, um, oh, I think this might be a, oh yeah, here we go, a video. So now I'm getting the same structure as I had before, but I get my nice samples as I go around. And this allows me to do something like evaluate a geodesic. So this is my posterior. So this, was a, this is, a, say, a toy data set, so I know what I should get back. If I specify this as the input and this as the output, and I say, find me the path between these two spaces, because we have the geodesic, you can basically, I'm going to find you the appropriate trajectory along this path. If you go in the VAE, you're basically saying, I've got this big sphere, and I'm starting here, I'm starting here, I'm going through the middle. Well, in the middle is not stuff. So you're basically going from that one to that one, but you're not following the trajectory of the data. Um, and the GAN is, similarly, the GAN is slightly better because the GAN is trying to compact the space into, it's trying to compact it so the prior is true, but you still get nonsense parts in the middle, because it's not possible to do that. Um, which is my aside on, on priors and latent spaces. Like, if you say, oh, I, I'm going to make the prior this, so I'm going to use my GAN to make the data have this distribution. But the problem I would have with that is that this is very strong statement. Saying you can definitely have this distribution is a very strong statement, because actually, say this is a posterior distribution, like the topology, if you're a mathematician of the latent space, it's basically saying, actually, not everywhere has the same degrees of freedom. Like here, I've got two degrees of freedom. Okay. Here, I've got two degrees of freedom, but here, I might only have one degree of freedom. Now, I can try and map that to this, but then my distances and my smoothness and everything in this space are going to be wrong, because this, is not, uh, this it isn't the same structure as this. And I would argue that if you know what this structure should be beforehand, then you don't need to do any learning, because half the battle is learning what... Like, if I give you some data, knowing what this structure looks like, is really the result of the learning. Very good, and I think we just finished there. So this is just a noisy reproduction test, so it does work when you do the noisy samples in this one as well. And the really interesting thing is when you, if you're training up um, from uh, noise, uh, sorry, you're training up with um, uncertainty being propagated through, you get this extra effect. So this is a log to the 10 of the training data set size for, say, MNIST, and the VAE, you need sort of 10,000 samples or something like that to be getting the same type of reconstruction with the same network as you do with 100 samples, say, for the, this model, because it's accounting for the uncertainty during training. Um, uh, limitations. Well, we, we need to, there's sort of, uh, there's some technical things. We, the, I've only shown you toy small images. There's nothing theoretical that stops you from scaling this up. It's just practical. Um, but the main thing is we're ensuring this data efficiency via the generative models, and we get these nice interpretable spaces that are nice and smooth. Um, very good. Um, that was our summary again, but then I think it's just... Thanks to everyone. So these are people involved in the networks at the start, deep belief networks at the end, and then for the future, might this be you? 
Uh, so we've got some mo from Zit. So if you're interested in coming and working on some of these things, we also do a lot of work in Bath with, with the Foundry and Dneg um, on some visual effects. So we use these generative models for visual effects. We also have postdoc positions to work on this kind of theoretical structure. And Ive has asked me to say Anthropics, with the company that Garraway did his work with, are also um, uh, looking for people to hire. So if you're interested in any of this, come and talk to myself or, uh, or Ivor afterwards. Thank you very much indeed.